The camps that sprang up across this waterlogged landscape a year ago are still there. As are the people who fled to them, nearly all of them Rohingya Muslims. Last year's sectarian fighting has a long history behind it, a legacy of fear and discrimination that smouldered under Burma's military governments. Many of the Rakhine Buddhists, the majority, are determined to drive out the Rohingyas, saying they don't belong. So they've been banished to the margins, unwanted and unrecognised. <laughs> At least the official camps are getting help. The International Development Minister, Alan Duncan, came last week to see how British aid is being spent and to assess the prospects of reconciliation. The Rohingyas were quite clear about what they'd like. We just want to return to our homes, this woman told him. We want our old lives back. But the Burmese authorities are just as clear that this won't happen. Strict segregation, they say, is the safest option. It is a profoundly unequal segregation that denies only the Rohingyas freedom of movement. But the government argues that pressure from local Buddhists has forced its hand. Well, it's very easy just to say the government should, let's say, give them citizenship or uh, treat them absolutely equally. The trouble is, we are looking at uh, an indigenous Burmese population who I think have an attitude which is going to take a long time to overcome. They've got a sense of identity which doesn't easily accommodate uh, incomers, even though they've been here for generations. The Rakhine state capital, Sitwe, is now an almost exclusively Buddhist town. Rohingyas need permission to come here, but few would dare anyway. In the town's main gym, I watched young men training. Some are hoping to represent their country when it hosts this year's Southeast Asian Games, another milestone on Burma's journey away from its former isolation. But it's not a journey they're willing to share with their one-time Muslim neighbors. It's not possible to live with him, and we don't want to. They invaded our country. It's not just me saying this. If you ask any Rakhine Buddhist, they will say the same thing. These are the last Rohingyas living inside the town of Sipwe. They haven't been pushed from their homes, and yet they're barred by the authorities from leaving, so they've got almost no access to work, to food, and medical treatment. They are, in effect, imprisoned in what's become a Rohingya ghetto. We were the first foreigners allowed into Ong Mingala for several weeks. And those who do get out can't come back. We travelled two hours north of Sitwe to see how more isolated Muslim communities are coping. Here, they're greatly outnumbered by Rakhine Buddhists, and relations have been extremely tense since last year's violence. This is the last of a ring of Buddhist villages which completely surround a single Muslim community called Anopin. It's just ahead of us, we're heading towards it now, and it leaves the Muslims there completely isolated, cut off and unable to move. The Rohingyas who live here say their village dates back 200 years. They're not, they insist, illegal Bengali immigrants, as most Burmese Buddhists believe. Mm -hmm. Ali has been designated the village's medical expert, although he's not a doctor. He explained how the clashes last year with the Buddhists had affected his community. They lost all their livestock, he said, and their boats, and now they can't travel, even to reach a clinic or hospital. Among the many difficulties these villagers face was the one that all Rohingyas complain about their lack of citizenship. This is so important for us because without proper ID cards, we can't go anywhere, not even to other towns in our own state. We've been given these white ID cards, but if we try to travel with those, we get arrested. There are Buddhists too who suffered last year. 
who lost their homes. Their numbers are small, though, and the government has built solid new houses for them to move into in time for the rainy season. It is in stark contrast to the way the displaced Rohingyas, more than 130,000 of them, still have to live. An injustice that must cast doubt on the hopes of a better future for this country.